Okay, okay my name is Runar, uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about Haskell. Uh, so, yeah, who am I? Uh, sorry, it cuts off the top of. Oh, well, that's, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so I am sort of an enterprise Java refugee. Uh, I spent uh, the, the beginning of my career doing uh, Java programming, and mostly sort of enterprise Java programming. And about 10 years ago, I came to uh, functional programming. Uh, and found Haskell, and after that I found Scala. Uh, at one point I wrote a book about functional programming in Scala, uh, which was uh, pretty great. And uh, at the moment I'm a lead engineer at a company called Tact, uh, and we do a lot of uh, purely functional programming in Haskell. Uh, and we are actually aggressively hiring Haskell programmers. So uh, you know, if you're interested in working in Haskell all day, contact me at uh, runar.tact.com. Uh, so, in this talk, I'm not going to teach you Haskell. Uh, my goal is really just to get you to uh, be curious about Haskell and to just sort of give it a try. So the agenda is just one item. Please give Haskell a go. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so what is Haskell? Haskell is uh, a programming language. It's a general purpose uh, programming language. It could be used to make uh, you know, web servers and command line tools, uh, games, enterprise software, as well as, you know, other programming languages. Uh, it's a popular language to implement other programming languages in. Um, so so the, the Haskell language itself uh, is separate from the implementations of, of Haskell. Um, the, the most popular one is uh, the glorious Haskell compiler. Uh, which compiles Haskell to uh, native code as well as uh, C and LLVM, uh, compiles it to JavaScript uh, or, or Java bytecode. Uh, so there are lots of different backends uh, for, for GSC, but the most, uh, most commonly used one is the native compiler. Uh, <clears throat> or you can, you know, you can compile uh, to GHC's own bytecode, which then gets interpreted by the GHC runtime. So, Haskell itself is not uh, opinionated about whether it's compiled or interpreted. <clears throat> well, Haskell has strong static types and it has full type inference. Uh, so we, you know, we, we tend to talk about types a lot in Haskell, but Haskell is actually able to infer most uh, of the types for us. Um, Haskell is also purely functional uh, and it is a lazy language. And we'll go into what that means here in a bit. Uh, so Haskell stands at the end of uh, decades of programming language research. Uh, it started out as Haskell 1.0 in, in the year 1990, so it's sort of venerable. Uh, the latest Haskell uh, language reference is Haskell 2010. Um, and the, the most modern sort of up-to-date implementation of, of a Haskell compiler is the glorious Glasgow Haskell compiler, uh, which is in version 8. And uh, 802 came out in January of 2017, and it's in active development. Uh, they're constantly adding new uh, things. And the Haskell language itself is extensible by design, and uh, GHC has a lot of uh, language extensions. And, uh, and so Haskell sort of represents the state of the art of, of uh, programming languages, uh, because whenever you know, a hot new uh, thing comes out in programming language research, uh, like dependent types or linear types or other things like that, they find implementations in Haskell uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so those things become available in Haskell uh, quite quickly. All right, so how to start in Haskell? Well, uh, you go to haskell.org and you can download uh, either uh, the Haskell platform or you can just download the Haskell compiler, but the recommended uh, method for beginners is to download the Haskell stack, which uh, will allow you to get up and running really quickly. Uh, comes with a bunch of libraries that all work together um, and, and uh, so is sort of opinionated about how you structure your Haskell project and things like that. So Haskell stack, great for beginners. Uh, there are lots of books on Haskell. Uh, some recent ones are uh, Haskell from First Principles uh, by Chris Allen and Julie Mornucki. Uh, that one is uh, really great, and it's pretty new and very up-to-date with regard to Haskell. Uh, there's a sort of uh, out of 
a little bit out of date one called Learn You a Haskell for Great Good, which is super fun. Uh, it's, it's an awesome book to, to go through. Uh, and then uh, there's a re recent one which is a little more advanced, which is called Parallel and Concurrent Programming in Haskell. Uh, I believe that one is by Simon Marlow. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's see some Haskell, right? Uh, let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's go see some Haskell. Okay, so if we start up GHCI from a terminal, uh, we get the, the Haskell uh, read eval print loop uh, with the, the Haskell uh, interpreter, okay? Uh, oh, I'm really sad that this is cutting off the top of my slides. Uh -oh. Yeah. Um, can we fix that somehow? I wonder. Yeah, I'm missing a whole line at the top here. Is it, it's actually slides, isn't it? Yeah, it's know. actually slides. God, I can start pressing buttons if you like. No, that's all right. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's the angle of that. What do you think? Um, no, it's actually cutting it off. OK, well, maybe I can try to switch into that. Because it would be great if I could actually uh, show my, my slides. Sorry about a slight delay. All right, so um, if we fire up uh, GACI from a terminal, uh, we can just start typing in Haskell expressions, and uh, they will be compiled to Haskell bytecode, and they'll be uh, interpreted for us. Uh, so you know, I can type in arithmetic expressions like this, um, and I can you know, apply functions to arguments. And you'll notice that Haskell uh, is, is very sort of syntax light. It's, very, it's a very quiet language syntactically. Uh, so the, the syntax for function application is just space. Right, so there are no parentheses around arguments. Uh, so here I'm passing the string hello to the reverse function. I'm getting the reverse. Um, if I want to pass two arguments to a function, I just separate them by spaces. So here I'm checking if p is an element of the string xelophon, which it is, so I get true. Um, so again, Haskell, very sort of quiet. Um, but we can use parentheses to disambiguate. Uh, so here uh, I'm passing the sort of the list 412 to reverse rather than passing the sort function and the list as arguments to reverse, right? So I, first I want to sort and then I want to pass that to reverse. Uh, so speaking of which, uh, Haskell is a functional language and so functions are first class values. And so here I'm, I'm creating a function in line that multiplies its argument by two. And so I just put parentheses around that and just say times two. Uh, and if I pass that to the uh, map function together with a list, uh, it will apply my function to every element in that list. Yes? So you make the parentheses there, so that is ambiguous. Yes, otherwise it will infer that as map times two, right? Got it. Yeah. Okay. So I need the parentheses around times two to say that this is a function that takes an additional argument. Um, uh, this, sorry? Oh, if I said map parentheses one times two? Yeah. Oh, that would, that would not work. That would, that's a type error. Because one times two is a number, but times two is a function that expects another. Right, so it's really, uh, map is expecting a function of the first yeah, the first argument to map should be a function. Uh, so speaking of which, Haskell is strongly statically typed. So uh, we, we were able to type in all of these expressions without ever mentioning any types, right? But, uh, and that's because Haskell actually infers the types for us. But Haskell is strongly and statically uh, typed. Uh, and uh, that's really great because you know types alert us to mistakes super quickly. Um, for instance, here you know I, I might want to take this sentence here, and it's not really loud enough for me, so I want to like turn it to uppercase and like append three uh, exclamation marks and maybe like a damn it on the end. Um, and, and so you know I might think like okay, well I'm just going to two upper that sentence and then append three exclamation marks. Okay, but Haskell comes back and says no. You cannot do this because, well, I expected to see characters, but I actually saw lists of characters. Uh, and it's saying, telling me where the error is. The, the error, the type error comes in two upper of sentence. 
So then I can actually ask Haskell, well, well what is the type of two upper? Like, what's actually wrong here? And two, Haskell comes back and says, well, two upper takes a character and turns it into a character. Uh, so it's uh, the colon colon reads uh, has type. So two upper has type car to car. So it's a function that takes a character and returns a character. So it actually operates on individual characters. Um, so I have a function uh, that can turn such a function into a function that operates on lists. So if I say map to upper, uh, then that becomes a new function that applies to upper to every element of a list. And in Haskell, strings are actually just lists of characters. And so now map to upper enables me to apply to upper to every character in the sentence. Uh, and now the quick brown fox really does jump over the lazy dog. Cool, so static typing for the win. Uh, it's really easy to make mistakes like this and, uh, and Haskell uh, catches them super early. Um, <clears throat> so now if we ask for the type of the map function, uh, Haskell comes back and says, well map has the type uh, like this. Uh, it takes a function as its first argument from A to B. As its second argument, it takes a list and it returns a list. So it takes a list of A and it returns a list of B, given a function from A to B. Another way of reading that is that map turns a function from A to B into a function from list of A to list of B. Right? So in Haskell, actually, every function just takes one argument. Uh, and the way that Haskell implements uh, functions that take two arguments is that uh, the function will just return another function that takes the, the next argument. Right? So map is actually a function that takes one argument and it returns a function that takes the list as the, as the next argument. So every function in Haskell is curried. But uh, okay, so what are these A, B things, right? Uh, these are actually type variables. Uh, so it's not actually specified what these types are. So, so they're uh, uh, generics, essentially. Uh, so, so the type of map is actually polymorphic. And we'll get into what that means here. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, if I, if I ask uh, what is the type of map, it'll tell me, well, it takes a function from A to B and turns into a list of A to list of B. Uh, but if I say map to upper, it will instantiate both A and B to be car. Right, so now uh, I, I've, I've uh, applied or I've, I've assigned these type variables to be the type of the car uh, type. So map will actually work for any type any two types A and B, and uh, with map to upper, actually I'm setting them both to be car. All right, so map is polymorphic. Uh, and it's not just functions that have polymorphic types in Haskell, but values can be polymorphic as well. Uh, I mean, functions are values, but, but values other than functions can be polymorphic. Uh, for example, the empty list, if we ask, what is the type of the empty list? Haskell comes back and says, well, the empty list has type list of T for all types T. Um, so it doesn't matter which type we pick as the element type of the list, it has no elements, so it's a list of T for all types T. Um, in fact, the empty list is the only list that has this polymorphic type. So if we have a value of this type, we know that it must be empty. And that's actually kind of cool because sometimes a type tells us everything we need to know and in Haskell, often the types will guide you towards uh, an implementation, or will guide you towards a correct implementation of your, uh, of your functions. Uh, for instance, if I ask, well, what is the type of the identity function? Well, the identity function takes an A for some type A and returns a, an A for the same type A. Uh, and this type actually tells us what the implementation of id is. It must return its argument. Because that's the only, the only way it can get an A to return is uh, but from that argument. Because it has no way of knowing what is the type of the, of the thing that you're going to pass in. Right? So uh, th this type completely determines this implementation. And here's another one that also uh, does that. And then you can see if you can guess what this does. So const takes an A and a B and returns an A. It must return its first argument. So it takes two arguments and it has to return the first one. That's the only thing this function could do. Uh, more complicated one here. Uh, flip takes a function that takes two arguments and it returns another function that takes two arguments. 
So the, the function that it takes takes an A and a B and returns a C, and the function it returns takes a B and an A and returns a C, so it flips the arguments. Right? Now, a fun exercise is what is the type of flip flip? Well, it will, it will sort of move that B over to the beginning. So flip flip will be a, a function that takes a B and a function from an A and a B to a C and then applies, and then an A, and then, a, and then applies the B and the A to, that, to the function that it got. Anyway, so Haskell allows us to do this sort of arithmetic with functions, essentially. Um, fun functions are very, very much first class uh, values. Uh, so Haskell also has uh, algebraic data types. We can specify our own uh, types. And, uh, and they're algebraic in the sense that they are composed of uh, that they have an algebra, and the algebra is that they are composed of uh, ands and ors. So it's sort of like a Boolean algebra. Um, and also for functions. <clears throat> for example, uh, the Boolean type, the Boolean type is not built into Haskell. Uh, it is just defined as a data type um, that has two ways of being constructed. It can be true or it can be false. So this is a data type declaration in Haskell, and this is the actual declaration of the bool type in the standard library. So uh, this declaration will actually create two values called uh, data constructors. And these uh, two data constructors are the only two ways that you can construct a bool. So there will be two values in scope, true and false, and they're both of type bool. Um, and so, so that was sort of one or the other. And you can also uh, do uh, and, so uh, uh, pairs of things. So uh, here is a a simple pair data type. So a pair of A has a single way of being constructed. It's a pair that takes uh, two A's. And what that does is it creates a single constructor called pair. Uh, and it takes an A and an A, and it constructs the pair of A and A. Right? Uh, it can be a little bit confusing to, to beginners that the type and the constructor have the same name. But that's sort of similar to what you would see in languages like, like Java. Um, but uh, in, in practice, we don't actually confuse types and constructors because one is at the type level and the other one is at the value level. And we normally don't talk about, the, uh, we normally don't talk about them in the same context. Uh, we can also combine uh, and and or, or products and, and sums um, by, by uh, you know, just nesting things. So here is a, a simple binary tree. Uh, so it's either a leaf, which contains an A, uh, or it's a node that contains two trees. All right, so it's a recursive data type. Uh, and this A thing is a type variable, again. So this is a generic type. Uh, it's not specified what the, uh, what the type is of the values that we put in the leaf. It could be anything. Right, so tree of int is an example of a concrete type. And the node there, does it have to be defined on the previous one, or is it implicit there to make a one-liner? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. Is node what? Is, is this a one-liner, or does the node have to get declared on a previous line? Oh, uh, yeah, this can all be put on a single line. This is just formatting for, for sort of yeah. niceness. I think node is defined in this uh, line that you see there. Yeah. So you define Yes, okay. Yeah, so, so this, this is defining node. So this is saying the definition of node is that it's a constructor of tree, and it takes two trees as arguments. Right. Cool. Um, so that's all algebraic data types. Um, another really cool uh, feature of Haskell is that it has type classes. And type classes are sort of unlike anything you might see in, uh, in other languages. I, I believe that this actually originates in Haskell. Uh, so if we ask, what is the type of two? Uh, Haskell will come back and say, well, it's not a concrete type, like integer or something. Um, it says it's of type A. So this reads, two has type A, given that A is a number type. So given that A is of class num, uh, two is of any such type. 
So two can play the role of a float or an integer or, or whatever implements the numeric interface. Uh, so, so num here is called a class or a type class. And, and that's not, it, it's not really similar to OO classes. It's more like OO interfaces. Um, but it's actually not like that either. Uh, the proper way to think about this is that it's a classification of types. Right, so, uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a class of types. There, there's a grouping of types, all of which uh, are numbers or are numeric. So they have to implement this num interface. Uh, another example of this is like the type of equality. Uh, it says that uh, the type of equality is it takes two A's and returns a bool, but A has to be of class eek. It has to, uh, it, ha it has to be an instance of this class. So somebody has to somewhere specify what is the definition of equality for your type before you can actually compare them for equality. Um, and lots of those are built into the standard language, like for instance, we can compare two lists for equality and we'll get true. Uh, but if we try to compare two functions for equality, we actually get a type error. Uh, is, and Haskell will tell us there is no evidence, so there's no instance for eek, there's no evidence that, there, that I'm able to compare these two functions for equality. <clears throat> and uh, we can ask Haskell for more information about the interface provided by a type class. Uh, if in GHDI, we can say colon i, which is uh, info. And so we can ask for the, for the information about like a type class. Uh, and that will give us the definition of the type class. Uh, it will also list all the types that it knows about that implement that type class. Uh, and for eek, that's actually really long, and so I've uh, left that out. Uh, and yeah, and colon i is like a really useful thing to know. Like you can ask GCI about types and type classes and, and whatever. Um, so yeah, the definition of the equal, equals class, or the eek class, is uh, that, so a is of class eek, uh, where there are implementations of equals and not equals. And it's telling us that the minimal definition, we have to give either equals or not equals, and it will be able to figure the other one out. And then it tells us where it's defined. Um, <clears throat> so to give an instance, uh, for instance, uh, we can write our own instances for our own data types. Or we can, in fact, write instances for other people's data types. Uh, so here's a simple data type uh, called maybe. Uh, maybe is sort of like uh, a one element list. It could be empty, it could be nothing or it could be just an A. So maybe A could be either just an A or it could be nothing. And uh, an instance for equality, so now I'm, I'm telling Haskell how to compare two maybes for equality. So I say, well given that I have an equality for A, I can build an equality for maybe A where uh, just X equals just Y precisely when X is equal to Y. And nothing equals nothing is always true, and anything else is false, right? So we can define our own instances of these, uh, of these uh, type classes. And uh, in a lot of cases, we don't actually have to. We can ask Haskell to just derive them for us. So for instance, in the case of equality, uh, we can just say this. Uh, and this just says, do the obvious thing, which is what we just showed. And ha Haskell you know, has uh, built-in rules to, uh, to figure that out. So that's really awesome. Yeah, and, uh, and the, the number of classes that you can derive is constantly expanding. Uh, uh, normally it's just sort of, it's like equality, ordering, and some other things, but uh, uh, there, there are some pretty co complex classes that you can now derive uh, automatically in Haskell. Okay, so, uh, why, why do we care about type classes? Well, uh, type classes um, give us this sort of extensible coupling of behaviors with types. Um, but but it, at the same time, it decouples the type definition from the behavior definition. Like they don't have to be defined in the same place. And, uh, and so we can have different behaviors for different types and, it, and, and type classes allow us to add behaviors uh, to types that we don't control. Uh, so it's, it's like adding methods to types to classes, or if you think in OO terms, it's like adding methods to classes you don't control. 
Um, and it also allows us to expand other people's APIs uh, to use our types, which is uh, super powerful. OK, so uh, Haskell is a purely functional language. And I promised I would say what that means. Um, so what does it mean? Um, what is purely functional? <clears throat> so uh, functional programming, I want to say, is not about uh, first class functions. It's not fundamentally about functions being values. And you know, it's not about higher order functions like uh, map or filter or things like that. Um, and Haskell, uh, sorry, functional programming is definitely not about lack of I.O. or things, or things like that, um, because Haskell can definitely do I.O. and Haskell is yet purely functional. Um, and uh, it's also not about immutable data, like fundamentally. Like Haskell can handle mutable data in a purely functional way. Uh, so what functional programming is, really, I want to say, is just it's programming with functions. Um, but functions uh, in a very restricted sense, uh, in, in the sort of mathematical sense. So uh, in Haskell, a function that has this type A to B, it has to map every value of type A to exactly one value of type B. And it has to do nothing other than this. Right? So it, it just takes an A, and it will give you a B, and there's nothing else, else that happens. So there are no side effects. Right? So uh, traditionally, when people think about side effects, uh, they think, think about things like I.O. and mutating memory and you know, reading from files. Um, and they think, oh, you, you can't do any of these things if you want to be purely functional because you know, there are side effects. So purely functional programming can't possibly do anything useful. Um, but that's not true. You can do all of these things using just functions. Um, the, the problem really here is that, that this is like just listing things like this is not a, a good definition of side effect. Uh, a side effect is, I want to say, anything that violates this property. And that property is that the meaning of any given expression depends only on the meaning of its sub-expressions. So when you see an expression in Haskell, uh, what it means to run that program or evaluate that expression doesn't depend on any state outside the program. It doesn't depend on, on anything other than what it means, what, what that program actually means. Right? And it always means the same thing. So a Haskell function will always return the same value given the same input. Uh, there, there, are, there are no external forces operating on a function other than its arguments. And the value returned by a Haskell function uh, doesn't have any hidden dependencies. There are no initialization steps that need to occur before you can call a Haskell function. Uh, it's always safe to call it. Uh, for, for example, from your tests, it's always safe to call Haskell function from your tests. And to test the Haskell function, uh, you just call it and then you look at the result and you compare whether the result uh, matches your expectations. Um, and so when you're, when you're looking at the result of calling a Haskell function, you, you are looking at everything that the function did with your input. Like there's nothing else that the function could have done other than returning the value uh, that you see. So this enables this sort of computation uh, model uh, where computation proceeds by simplification of, of expressions, uh, just like solving algebraic equations. Uh, so we can look at a simple example here. Uh, so P is a program here. Uh, and it consists of some sub-expressions x, y, and plus. And the meaning of P depends only on the meanings of x, y, and plus. So if we evaluate uh, x and y, and we can substitute them in to this expression, and we get the same expression we started with, essentially. It means the same thing. Uh, and we can even go further, and we can substitute in the meaning of plus as well. So this p is the same as the p before. right? And in Haskell, every program has this property. There are, there are no there are no Haskell programs that don't have this property. Well, pro properly, uh, there are ways you can cheat, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Uh, so a Haskell program actually is a single referentially transparent expression. And I, I think that's sort of a, a cool thing. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a little Haskell program. So this is a little hello world. Um, 
So this program <coughs> will print a string to the console. It prints out the string hello world to standard out uh, when you run it. So uh, if you look at what is the type of main, actually this is wrong, it should be IO with two parentheses like that. Uh, but uh, it, it returns a, uh, a value. So this is a function or a, an expression. And the, the uh, type of this expression is IO. Uh, and what does that mean? It means that when the runtime calls this function, it will get a value back. And that value uh, describes what, should hap what the runtime should do. And what the runtime should do is print hello world to the, to the console. All right, so <clears throat> so the, the, the Haskell program doesn't do this as a side effect. It returns a description of what should happen when the runtime calls the program. Okay? So the only thing that can actually do I.O. Uh, is the runtime system. So we cannot do I.O. in our programs. <clears throat> so then... Uh, uh, yeah, so th what's the type of put string line that, that puts a string to the console? Uh, it's of type string to IO unit. Means it takes a string and it returns one of these IO values. And uh, the open close parenthesis means it's, it has type unit or it's empty. It, it ha it's a type that has no structure. Um, and get line is not a string, it's an IO string. So it's, it doesn't give you a string. It gives you an I.O. program that returns a string when it's passed to the runtime system. <clears throat> so then how do we put these things together, right? Like if we want to write a program that get, reads a line and then prints it again, how do we put them together? Well, um, Haskell has functions to combine I.O. programs as first class citizens. Right, so to combine get line to, and put string line here, uh, so this is a program that will read a single line from the console and then echo that line back out. And the, this uh, operator here is, is pronounced bind. And bind has this type that it takes an IO of A, get line as IO string, and it will take a function from A to IO B, put string line has type string to IO unit, and then it will turn uh, an IO of B, in this case an IO of unit, which is correct. This is the correct type for main. So this main will be you know, a little I.O. script like this that is a combination of get line and put string line. All right, so Haskell allows us to talk about uh, I.O. operating uh, actions or programs as a first class citizen in the language. And we can write the same exact program uh, using what's called a, a do notation. And when I say same exact program, this actually is the same program. It's just the syntactic sugar for the bind operator. So main here is the same it's the exact same program as main here. Uh, so in the syntactic sugar, we can write this sort of as an imperative program where we say, well, do, and we can even put curly braces and semicolons, and it looks like an imperative programming language, right? Uh, and so we say line comes from get line, and then we say put string line of line, right? Uh, but we can actually omit the the curly braces and the and these semicolons in case you were worried about that. Yeah, so so Haskell actually has a significant white space, and so all you have to do is indent uh, the block, and, and you can omit the curly braces. And the semicolons are not necessarily unless you want to put the statements on the same lines. Um, so yeah, Haskell is actually a pretty great imperative programming language uh, because being able to talk about imperatives as first class objects in the language. Uh, is, is pretty powerful. In fact, Haskell uh, comes with uh, a number of uh, combinators or functions that operate on IO values like this. So just to uh, highlight the, the top one here, sequence, it takes a list of IO actions and returns an IO action of a list, uh, which it will, the list will be all of the things that those IO actions returned. Uh, and here at the, at the bottom, uh, while is actually just a function. It takes an I.O. of a Boolean, and it will keep doing it until it turns to false. So Haskell actually has no looping constructs at all. Uh, everything is done by recursion. Repetition is always accomplished by recursion. So here, for example, to, to sum a list, uh, 
I'm doing this by pattern matching on the list. So sum of the empty list is zero. And then I say sum of the list. So colon means construct the list. It's, uh, it's the same as uh, uh, cons in uh, like a lisp. So sum of the linked list with x at the head and x's as the rest of the list is just x plus the sum of x's. So it's a recursive definition. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a pretty common pattern. Uh, so we can write product in the exact same way, except it has 1 and, and times instead of 0 and plus. And so these common patterns are often factored out into uh, functions that we can reuse. Uh, so in, in this case, it's the function fold right. Uh, and so sum is fold right with plus and 0, and product is fold right with times and 1. Uh, there's also a fold left, which uh, folds it in the, in the opposite uh, direction. Uh, and uh, like we can reverse a list by folding it to the left with the flipped constructor of the list. So the next time somebody asks you to reverse a linked list on a whiteboard in an interview question, just throw this up at them. <laughs> yeah, Fold left, flip cons, empty list. Great. So uh, another cool thing about Haskell is that it is lazy. So uh, uh, laziness is something we're all sort of familiar with from other languages, uh, but, but Haskell is sort of fully lazy. Uh, in most, of the, most languages, if we see something like this, like, oh, if, if the length of x is a 0, or the length of x is a, uh, y is a 0, then something else, something else. We expect two things. We expect if the first condition here in this or is true, we don't even check the length of y's, right? We expect this to short circuit. And also, we expect the, uh, if we execute the then branch, we don't even look at the else branch, right? So we expect that to be lazy as well. Uh, in Haskell, everything has this property. Everything is lazy. Uh, in, in fact, uh, or is not special. It's just implemented as an ordinary Haskell function. Uh, and uh, it's, this says that, uh, well, true or anything is true. And we don't even have to look at that other anything. Uh, and false or x is x. And the magic here is that Haskell will not even look at x. It will just return it unevaluated. Right? <clears throat> so uh, laziness allows us to do things, cool things like construct infinite lists. So I can say, well, ends is 1, 2, etc. This is the infinite list of numbers starting from 1. Uh, and we can do cool things like ask if any of the elements of this infinite list are even. Um, and Haskell will come back and say, yeah, there are some even numbers in this infinite list. Um, it doesn't construct the infinite list, obviously, but it will just construct exactly enough so that it can figure out whether any of them are even. Um, if you said all even, it would run forever. Yeah. Uh, or if you said, are any of them less than zero here, it would run forever as well. Oh, you're right. Yeah, no, if you said all even, it would also terminate, because the first one is odd. Yeah, you're right. Uh, OK. OK, great. Uh, so any and even here are not or, uh, special. They're, they're ordinary Haskell functions. Uh, this, this is not special syntax. Any less than one would be an endless loop, yeah, I think so. Because it, it, we'll have to look at the whole list to figure that out. Um, OK, so this function here, prefix, it returns true whenever one of the arguments is a prefix of the other. So this zip width uh, thing compares for equality of corresponding elements of x's and y's. And prefix will return true if all of the comparisons are true. And we can actually do this with infinite lists. Uh, we can say, well, 1, et cetera, is a prefix uh, of 101. Right? We can ask whether that's the case, and it will immediately say false. Because they don't, uh, they're not equal on the first element, and so it immediately knows this must be false. Uh, we can generate the entire Fibonacci sequence as a list. It wouldn't be a functional programming talk if we didn't have Fibonacci's. So we should say the Fibonacci sequence is 0 followed by 1, followed by uh, the element-wise, or zip with the element-wise sum, or plus, of fibs, so the entire sequence together with the tail of the entire sequence. All right. So tail of fibs will start at 1 and then do zip with plus fibs tail fibs. All right. <coughs> so this is the entire Fibonacci sequence. And then we can ask for the first 10 fibs, and it will give, us, give them to us. And we can ask for the 10,000th one, and Haskell will just say, yeah, that's fine. Um, and laziness gives us this radical sort of code reuse. For example, if we want to get the smallest element of a list, uh, we can just sort the list and then get the first element. Haskell will not only sort the list as far as it needs to, 
Uh, so, and so it will actually only pass over the list once and it'll find the smallest element uh, because as soon as it finds the smallest element, it will put that at the head of the output list and head will be like, yeah, I got my, I got, I got what I need. And so uh, Haskell will, will allow us to do this sort of code reuse to, to write min in terms of sort. Uh, now in another language, this might be super inefficient because we'd have to like sort the whole list and then get the first element from the sorted list. But Haskell uh, will only do as much work as necessary. Um, yeah, the last super cool feature of Haskell uh, that I want to show is uh, uh, higher order polymorphism, which is something that most languages just don't have. Um, so uh, if we sum a list like this, um, you know, it's a pretty straightforward uh, operation. But if we ask, well, what is the type of sum? It comes back and gives us this thing. It says, well, sum is of type T of A to A, where T is foldable and A is a numeric type. Right? So any T that you could fold, if it's full of numbers, you can sum all of those numbers. Um, and uh, list is, happens to be foldable, but there are other things that are foldable, like trees. So I can run the same function, sum, this is, so this is not a different sum function, it's the exact same function to sum a tree. Yeah? Oh, uh, yeah, foldable essentially means you can turn it into a list. That's basically what it means. Um, uh, yeah, it will, it will be like a, uh, what is it called, a pre-order or in order? I, I forget which one it is. But it's like the, it, with a binary tree, it's like starting with the leftmost and going to the rightmost. Um, so if you recall this function from the IO uh, portion, uh, sequence, which takes a list of IO actions and it turns that into a single action that returns a list of all of the results of those IO actions. Uh, if we ask what is the actual type of sequence, Haskell will tell us, well, the actual type is not specialized to I.O. Uh, the real type says, well, as long as M is an instance of the monad class. Monad. Yeah, I mean, couldn't have Haskell about monads. As long as M has an instance of the monad class, we can turn the list of M's into an M of a list, right? And so M could be I.O., right? But M could also be some other stuff. It could be maybe. Uh, so, uh, so, so sequence has all of these types. So the most general type for, for sequence, actually it has a, a more general type than this, but this is as general as I'm willing to go. Uh, the type of sequence is, is at the top, but it also has all of these special, specialized types. If I specialize M to IO, it has, has that IO type. Uh, but it could also be maybe, M could be maybe, where I have a list <coughs> full of maybes, which might be, each of them could be an A or nothing, and it will turn a maybe of a list and that maybe will be nothing if any of the elements of the input list are nothing. Otherwise, it will give me a list of all of the ones that, uh, of everything, right? And uh, functions also happen to be an instance of the monad class. And so I can take a list of functions that all take an integer uh, and return an A, and I can apply them all to one integer. And it will give me a list of all the results. Right? And, then, and crucially, this sequence function had to be written once for all of these types. And not just all of these types, but all future types that fit that monad pattern. Right? Totally awesome. Because lots and lots of things are monads, it turns out. Um, right, so that's, uh, that's my sort of quick intro to, to, to cool things in Haskell. Uh, so Haskell, in, in summary, is, is uh, very venerable, but it's totally up to date with like, the latest programming language research. And so like, if you don't want to wait 20 years for Java to implement some um, programming language uh, feature, then like, just pick up Haskell and it'll probably have it. Um, Haskell is, so, sort of forces the functional approach, so like, you can't fall off the, the rails. Uh, there, there, there are escape hatches, but like, they're... Uh, they may as well not be there. Um, Haskell is, is sort of mind-bending, and I want to say in a good way. Like, it forces you to think differently about programming. And so uh, if you want to just sort of expand your mind about 
programming in general, uh, Haskell is a good, uh, good language to pick up because it, it does force that functional approach. Uh, there's no cheating. And I actually just find Haskell really delightful to, to work in. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it gets sort of out of my way. It's very, it guides me through implementations using types. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it's like my favorite language in the world. It's amazing. Uh, and also I want to say, like, the, you know, Haskell is totally ready. Uh, it, it's not, uh, it's not just like an academic language, or, and it's not just uh, something to do for, for fun. Like at, at TACT, we're using Haskell in production, and it's super fast and amazing. Uh, I mean, it compiles to, to native code, and we deploy it in Docker containers, and, uh, and it's you know, servicing millions of customers, um, and it's, it's been really, really good. Uh, so I want to encourage you to try Haskell. And that's all I got. Thank you. Do I have time for questions, do you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've got uh, five minutes. Five minutes for questions. Any questions about Haskell? Yeah. Um, there are two questions. The first one, uh, which is a sample, which is what you call the statistics. So you, you talked about side effects. It's really hard for me to separate the design assumption, which doesn't depend on something as large as a dog eat or something like that. Right. Uh, well, let's go back to the read line. Uh, Well, let's do a simple thing like readline, right? Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so get line definitely has a, an effect, right? It, it does. It's, it doesn't have a side effect in the same in the sense that the meaning of get line uh, actually just depends on uh, on nothing other other than 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 that. But but what it actually then uh, produces is one of these uh, I/O scripts, right? But, but the, and the important thing is that you actually cannot look at that string, right? Like, what you, you say get line, you don't get a string. You can't, like, take the length of that string, for instance. You, what you have to do is that you have to return that I.O. string to the runtime system. But if you want to then inspect the string or put, put the string back to the console, you ha also have to tell the runtime system what to do next once it has that string. Right? So all of the effects happen outside of your program and are therefore not side effects. Does that make sense? Oh, if you wanted to two upper? Yeah, yeah, that's the same kind of thing. Uh, you would, so IO implements map. Uh, so you can uh, say map to upper over get line. And that will construct an IO of string, which will get a string from the console, turn it into an uppercase string, which you can then use by using bind or by using uh, this uh, syntax here. Don't know. Yeah. But, but the, uh, maybe a cool thing to think about here is like, uh, if you have a, a you, sorry, in, in Haskell you could say get line, and you could put get line like four times in a list. So it's a list of four get lines, right? Uh, so so you you won't be when you look at that list, you won't be getting any lines. All you're getting are these I/O strings. Okay. Sure. Uh, 
Oh, what is the, the strength of Haskell? I, I think the strength of Haskell is, is the purely functional programming. Like, basically, if you want to do pure, purely functional. What's the strength of purely functional programming? Oh, you mean in terms of a specific domain? Yeah. I, I think actually all, all domains benefit from this approach. Uh, but I, I think the closer that your domain is like to mathematics, the, the more you're going to get. Like finance, uh, Haskell is super popular in finance. Uh, it's very popular in, in other things like that. Yeah, is there a question? I guess the answer then is that the, the, the suitability for a domain is, is not like a, a yes or no thing. It's, it's more of like a, a scale. And I guess to the extent that your program is like sort of throwaway, the less you're going to benefit from, from Haskell. Uh, the more you have to maintain your code base over time, uh, the, the more you have to sort of totally understand what your program does, uh, the, the more you benefit from it. Like if you're just throwing up a website that you want to show a client like as a quick thing, like uh, Haskell might not be a good fit for that. Um. Yeah, the, mo uh, the more complex your reasoning, the more applicable it's going to be. Yeah, definitely. Uh, pr pretty rich. I mean, ha Haskell has been around for a long time, and so there, there are lots and lots of packages, uh, lots, of, lots of awesome, cool libraries uh, that, I, yeah, that I didn't mention. Um, like, awesome, like, like Servant, for instance, is a, a web uh, service framework where you can just like, specify the type of your API, and it will generate a web server for you that implements that uh, type. It's like, totally awesome. What's that? Oh, there's a package management system, yeah. Uh, the Cabal and, and uh, there's also a stack. Uh, so there's more than one package management system. I, th I think so. I, I think they can inter interact, but like, yeah. And there's, also, there's hackage and then there's stackage. Uh, so yeah. <coughs> they use the same packages, but they, they use different implementations of the repo. So, yeah. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Like you can oh, here, maybe I can show it to you. Google. Who? Yeah, Google. Or actually, Hey You is better. Uh, am I over time now? Uh, probably. Probably, we should probably close up. Then. I should close up. Oh, that. Like, oh no, it auto corrected to Yahoo. <laughs> no, Hey You. Oh it, no, it's I, it's not actually Hey uh, Oh, now I don't know how to get there. Come on. Oh, it's, uh, hey, you. I'm just gonna do a Google search for it. it. It's like you type in a type signature and it gives you uh, a list of functions that implement that type signature in the libraries, in the Haskell libraries. Hey, you Haskell API search. You know, so like, let's say, you know, I want to find a function that takes an IO uh, list of A and turns it into a, no, sorry, a list of IOs and turns it into an IO of list of A. Uh, and search. And hey, you will come back, hopefully, with sequence. So if the API doesn't fail us. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> oh, actually, the first one is uh, parallel. I guess it runs all of them in parallel. Uh, and here's sequence. So, pretty cool. And it, and you can put uh, type signatures in here, like instead of IO, I mean type variables. Instead of IO, I can say M. And then it will find me all of the things that match this pattern. Totally awesome. So types are great. Okay, thank you.